And uh, next up, we have Henning Diedrich, who is a senior programmer at IBM, their internal blockchain expert and um, IoT lead. Um, and also uh, one of the original members of our Koala group. Hello, everyone. So Australian culture has this concept of dreams. And the dream is something around you. You're in that. A dream is no time. It's not actually dream time. That's not quite correct. And it is also strongly connected to a place. So that's a very interesting concept and to your emphasis. And there were places so sacred, sacred in the past that um, you had basically not for everyone the allowance to go there. So dreams anchored to Earth. That might not immediately be obvious, but that has a lot to do with why we're here. The last time um, I was on, on a blockchain conference like this, I had a very interesting conversation with a friend, and he wanted to come up with a new programming language, a programming language that would allow you to not create a virtual reality like normal programming languages do, but a programming language that allows you to create a virtual reality between virtual reality and real reality. And I protested that. Because if you think it through, I said, if you do the product design right, you might discover that you need a locking mechanism. Because if you want to have a shared dream, which a virtual reality is, and not just dream on your own, you somehow have to make a decision. You have to have a mechanism that allows you to say, OK, this can of Coke stands here, or it stands here. Otherwise, you dream alone. And if you think that through, you end up with something that looks a lot like matter. And actually, this divide between real reality and virtual reality, where everything can be copied, is exactly what the blockchain is all about. Before I get technical, uh, I want to relate a little bit of a story. When I first met Primavera, that was uh, on the deck of a wonderful uh, house in San Francisco, and she was all about singularity. Who knows what singularity is? Right, pretty technical crowd. So. For the other half, singularity is the belief that not too far away now, we will all merge our brains together in one big computer. And it's supposed to happen in our lifetime. Maybe around 2030, we should all have the chance to merge in a hardware that doesn't exist now, but will exist then. And we will all be one, and we will all be in one, uh, one living being, so to say. I was outraged because I... <laughs> I just, I can't believe it. I mean, this is a real old story. We'll all be one. There's really only one mind. And I have to say, obviously, I don't believe in singularity, at least not that we will all merge into one computer. I also feel like I have a real life, and I'm not, I'm quite happy about it. <laughs> so, but it's amazing to see how, how a lot of smart guys, and I, they, they don't, uh, they really find this kind of, myth for Effie is super exciting, and it's also not disturbing them that it has a lot of similarity from its pattern with something that exists for a long time now. And it's with us as religions or myth um, for, for ages. So, but the problem is, and that's something I'm not just saying to insult anybody who likes the idea of singularity, but if you think you're a machine, basically, people are leaving, <laughs> then uh, <laughs> that has consequences. <laughs> oh, you're not leaving. <laughs> and if you believe that everything about you is something that is replicatable, that has consequences. Because then it will inform how you act. And 
just like Vitalik, for example, is working really hard to solve the proof of stake improvement to Ethereum because he has a visceral reaction to the wastefulness of proof of work where Bitcoin is right now wasting 300 million a year in electricity power just to keep the network safe. Just the same, Primavera has this idea that um, the mercilessness and straightness of machine is so much more likable than the sneakiness of human beings. Fair enough. But so people created Bitcoin and to some extent even Ethereum. And to organize um, this conference really is a dream of interesting things. But there are very um, real possibilities now to deep freeze your body, for example, to try to have a chance at least at living forever. And the medical professions um, tell us that they might be rather close to discovering the trick for eternal life. On the other hand, we have inventions like the plantoid that is standing outside, and I hope you all saw it, this wonderful steel plant that you can feed with Bitcoin, and that's the way it can replicate. Because the idea is, if I understood it right, you send Bitcoin to the plantoid, it will give you a wonderful show. And then at some point it can have enough money in the bank so that it can buy basically an artist to create a new plantoid. That's not quite right. Anyway, uh, if you think about it, flowers used to be, flowers have a long tradition to explain procrastination, right? Uh, explain uh, procreation. <laughs> that was in a time when sex was just a dirty word and you couldn't even speak about it with your children, so you spoke about plants and bees and... And now, outside, we have this dream of a steel plant. And that's quite interesting, I think. And it's even a steel plant made out of chains. And that's crazy. And that's great. And <laughs> I can't say how much I, I admire that work of art. But at the same time, it says a lot about what we're looking at here. And we have to be clear what that is. But it also tells us how crazy we have to be to deal with this invention, the blockchain, and to dare to dream, and to come up with something that's unheard of, like the plantoid. So, at IBM, there's a quip about that. You can be blinded by what you know. For example, IBM was really big in laser printing, and they, the researchers at IBM knew that you cannot possibly create a mirror that you need for IBM laser printers or for laser printers that can be produced in a way that it could be economic enough to work for a consumer market. Now, Canon didn't get it. They just produced a laser printer that worked for the consumer market and basically got HP in that business. So you pay dearly if you think that what you know is true and there is no other truth. And by that, stop innovating. However, um, there's also another aspect to the whole thing, and that is we have a lot of hype. And that hype can be dangerous, because there are some things that are not actually solved at this point. And we are inventing a new wheel, and the, the blockchain is something that's really like putting everything on its head that database scientists used to think they know how a database must be designed. And that's a genius thing. And there are new, thing possible, new things possible for that. But we're not quite there yet. Some problems are not solved, and we have to keep that in mind, because the solutions we might be finding might shape what we can do with it. And just like we would all like to have the solution of fusion energy for the energy problems of the world, and we all know that would really it. It unfortunately doesn't say that we will find fusion energy, or when we will find how it can work. So, I think 2016 might become a tough year for the scene, with less enthusiasm. And so it's even more important that we get really straight about what can be done with this, and what can we be done with it now and to really understand and try to get ahead, our heads around it. And it's not easy, it takes some time to understand all the implications, everything that uh, 
you you thought was uh, never going together, and that all, all all of a sudden you can have two things that seems to be always like you just couldn't get it. All of a sudden you have a situation where you have something that's digital, but you cannot actually copy it, or that's the good thing about it. So. When we talk about smart contracts, there are standard examples, like the fridge that refills itself with food when it's realized that you're low on something, and the exciting possibility with the blockchain is that fridge can actually really have a budget. It can go out and, and buy stuff, but it can also buy service, and it can, and can realize um, that uh, you have a certain tendency to do certain things. So it can become a real entity communicating with you and, and become so much more than just the fridge. And I believe that we will certainly see self-driving cars that are taxis, uh, that are their own corporation, because they can have bank, they can have money in the bank. Maybe the legal framework can be created that they can incorporate, and they're basically going to be robots. They they are not going to look quite like robots like we know from science fiction, but actually they are exactly that, and they might become autonomous. We have the technology now. At some point, in some jurisdiction, I think it will, it will happen. We could have self-sufficient hotels that use Yelp to rate their own employees, that use other services and uh, use quality feedback to understand what's going on in, in their business. And, of course, the, the big question is, if no one owns these entities and these machines, what will happen with that? What will happen with the profits that these machines might create? Will they be understood as a new form of common good? Which is something that in the past had quite some role. It's becoming less and less, but it's also rhythms. Will we all own these machines? Or the state? So, there are other applications. We will see future superhighways. That will, the traffic will look so incredibly different. And um, the blockchain will have, or can have, a very strong um, part in even this kind of stuff, I mean, traffic, just organizing who's got the right of way and who's coming from where, and how can you best um, create a, um, a p traffic pattern that suits everybody best. So all these kind of negotiations where entities that don't trust each other, that don't know each other, come together. That's where the blockchain can have an application, and it's really many. So information, of course, can save lives, medical records, access controlled by the patient. I really hope we will see that. And the point in all these applications is that the blockchain allows us to trust where we have no good fundamental reason to trust, where we cannot look into somebody's eyes and say, OK, let's do business, because I learned stuff about you. I think I understand why you tick. And now let's go forward. For human beings, it's a real blessing. I mean, um, but computers will never have that. Now, that we can have that with a blockchain will allow computers to do a different kind of commerce with each other. And in general, what we're all talking about here when we talk about blockchain, we talk about the general's problem. And that plagues every distributed system. And at the heart of it, it means um, two computers can never really know that they have the same idea about the world around them. Basically, until the blockchain, in a way. But the blockchain is solving these hard problems in a certain way that has limitations. And we have the situation now that until Bitcoin, it was believed that you could not possibly have something like a digital currency because, yeah, if you have a couple of numbers and they mean you have a certain amount of money, what keeps you from just copying them? What keeps you from just spending them once and then spending them another time and buying stuff from it just from your copies? And this basic principle is not only good for money. This basic locking mechanism, so to say, where we can agree on what the truth is, who owns, in the simplest case, money, who has the right, who has the title to something, where we can agree that there's only one 
title and not two and not just I have it and you have it or now I have one and now all of a sudden I have it two and give it to you and I also give it to you. And this is what the blockchain has as a new addition to the possibilities of IT to offer, to really revolutionize commerce and allow for the creation of new markets. Now it's quite interesting that um, with a blockchain, we're pretty close to something very big. I think that it's uh, so big that we can't really see it in this moment. Now we have highways, now we have the internet. We can't remember how it was before highways, but they were an equally big revolution of commerce. The internet, we all have seen that. And I vividly remember, for example, when all of a sudden, illegally of course, um, you had access to all the music of the world, basically. That, that was a really strong feeling. It wasn't like that before. A Wikipedia. I mean, the way you learn today, the way you look stuff up today, this has so accelerated how we can react to stuff, how we can learn, how we can produce stuff. And this degree of change is what we can expect from blockchain, if everything goes right. <laughs> um, another example of what the blockchain is about, is about is that I'm trying hard in the moment to give certain pointers for you to follow a certain vision or a certain idea that I'm trying to describe. And the interesting point is that I try to give you the building blocks. And I'm trying to not just give you the results. And these individual steps on the way to getting your heads around it is something that hopefully many in the audience will right now try to piece together and build, your, build their own judgment, whether it makes sense or it doesn't, what each of the speakers in this conference is going to say. And this is very much how the blockchain works. It's super inefficient. It would be so much better if we could just download the brain contents of somebody else, right? But it's quite safe. Because it means that every one of you, hopefully, is going to calculate through what they think is correct or is incorrect, and might even find flaws, and then point the community towards it. And that's exactly how computers that are joined into the blockchain work. Every single computer is calculating the whole thing through himself. Every piece of information, and there the blockchain has an advantage, stupid computers have this advantage, every piece of information is digital. It's yes or no, it's very strict. There's no ambiguity. And it's signed. And the signature means that every piece of information that all these computers in the blockchain piece together for themselves is reliable in itself because nobody but the person or the account that was owning that public-private key pair that this transaction is based on could have given that signature. So all the building blocks are reliable. And the piecing together happening in each computer is what makes the idea that all these computers have of what the truth should be reliable. So, in the end, I mean, of course, as I said, this is the least economic way to calculate something. And that is exactly where the blockchain has a problem. We have to find out how, we can, how can we scale that? How can we scale that in a way that not only a couple of computers or a thousand, but millions or billions could come to this kind of agreement. And in a way, of course, we have to watch out because this is AI right there. It's not AI like we might have expected it. It's not about a computer becoming aware. It's not about um, a computer talking with you and uh, making you think that, you're, that it's a human being. But it is incredibly emergent. All these little smart contracts that we're going to piece together going into the future will interact with each other. But really, we have no idea what's going to happen then. And we're already fighting in, in the research community, so to say, about how we best prevent the chaos from overwhelming the whole system that might ensue, or how much chaos might be needed for it to have a good start. Because 
frankly, I mean, the internet was able to grow the way it grew because there was a lot of freedom there that was then later exploited by people who started to spam and phishing and, and do bad harm to people that were trapped into the openness and, and the freedom that the internet provided also for criminals. And that is a pattern that we see again and again. But of course, we won't be happy if the blockchain community would just be able to restrict the whole thing in a way that it cannot grow. Or if regulators did that, or the law. So when we look at um, where this all can go, and uh, if I come back to what we can dream if we look into each other's eyes. I think we're very fortunate that we have a community here that has a power of thought, certainly a very smart group of people, but also of the heart. And that's incredibly important in this whole thing because there's incredible responsibility involved in all this. And there are so many things, unfortunately, that this could be misused for, but also so many traps that the whole development could fall into. And the big advantage, of course, that we have is um, that we are not confronted with the blockchain being as blurry as human communication. One and one is two. We're dealing with very basic building blocks at this moment. And if we're modest enough and we can just see what's possible in the moment, and don't go overboard and, and lose the grounding in the plans that we are trying to um, realize on the blockchain, but keep it to what is possible right now. Then I think, um, with the help of uh, a little bit of luck, <laughs> um, we will be able to stay together as a community. We will be able to reunite the forces that maybe in the moment where um, we get about into struggling what's the right way forward and where we run the risk of not agreeing and by that weakening the community is uh, as low as possible. And by the way, again, that's exactly how the blockchain works. If you have a node that doesn't agree with what the rest of the nodes in the computer calculate, nobody actually cares. It's just ignored. So there's no way to force your opinion on the rest of the members of the network. There's no way that you can just uh, create your new reality and then it says, no, this is actually it, and stall the network with that. Except, of course, if you win a majority. And that's exactly how the blockchain works. If one computer decides, no, I don't agree, but everybody else agrees, well, this really only means that computer is not taking part in the common vision of what the truth is anymore. And there's not even necessarily a mechanism that expels it. It's just not taking part anymore. So, um, what can happen, of course, and again, um, I'm talking as well about this community as about blockchain, the whole network can split. That's a bad thing, and that is something where there is an actual weakness in the blockchain technology as it exists today. But it, there's also mechanisms built in with a lot of foresight how it can be rejoined and how at, this, at a later point, if basically in two groups, two different sizable groups, two different ideas about the truth prevail, in the end they can come together again. But it's far from a perfect solution and, in fact, it can lead to very poor results that make the blockchain unsuitable for a couple of things. And a lot of thought is, in this moment, going into how a split can be avoided, going for different applications, where blockchain, for example, should be used for financial applications, and you just can't have that you have a split in the community and then some run on a certain assumption for a while and some others on another assumption, and then Later, they come together again, discarding, basically, the truth of one of those two forks, as that's called. So, 
there are problems, we have to address them. Unfortunately, it's not quite sure, at least not to me, that some of these problems are not as big as fusion reaction. Well, we would all love to see it, but the smartest brains working on it still are no guarantee that it actually going to happen. And uh, let's be aware that this is really something that is so new that it could be called AI. It's just a different form of it. So let's not fall into the fallacy that everything that we actually meet and that we see and that becomes real is not called AI anymore because now it's all of a sudden normal. AI, we think, is something we only know from science fictions and we have a certain feeling about how, how that should come across. But then again, if we look at all the stuff that we have now, a lot of that actually looked a lot like science fiction when it first arrived. And I think that's sometimes not appreciated enough. I mean, just look at the CD. I mean, it looks like science fiction. <laughs> Although it's completely just looking like that for the function of it. And that's super exciting, I think. And it's called the AI effect. We, if you look at stuff that can do amazing things, but just because it became reality, we don't appreciate the power and the enormous potential in it anymore. But the heart of the matter is, what we see as an imagined feature, and one, um, as I just tried to describe, what we see as a mechanism in the blockchain is modeled amazingly closely to how human brains work. So, how would we, if we take a step back, how would we log logically expect what should happen when we successfully model one special aspect of the mind, namely the way how it checks whether it's being told the truth or not. In an IBM mainframe or in a space shuttle, I was discussing yesterday how many threads are actually running in a mainframe to make sure that it never fails. Unlike a normal computer, in a mainframe, everything is calculated at least twice in parallel. And if there's no agreement, then there's an automa automatism that makes sure this whole thing is recalculated and the faulty processor is switched off. In space shuttles and in jets, you also have the same thing. You have stuff being calculated at least twice, but usually three or up to five times. So the blockchain is a method to get computers to agree. It's as simple as that. And that was not possible, or was thought to be not possible before Bitcoin. And now we have that capacity. And where can that lead us? So the very hard problem that Bitcoin is solving is, of course, something that has been solved in different ways in different times, payment. And I don't know if uh, any one of you knows the story about this kind of payment, where it's just like, this is basically a coin and nobody will bother to carry it around because it's a little bit heavy. But the culture using that coin understood that actually it doesn't really matter that somebody needs to carry it around. It only matters that everybody agrees who owns it at any given time. So the coins were basically standing around in the landscape, but it was always clear who owned them. And there were few enough of them that everybody could remember who owns them. It was testament, of course, to the actual reality that it doesn't really matter where the currency exists. It's just that we agree about it. Who owns what? That makes it useful. So having cryptocurrency um, makes commerce really powerful. And one thing that I think is quite important to understand is that if we talk about smart contracts, contracts that execute themselves that cannot be stopped, that are ideally law formulated in code so that we don't have any ambiguity later when something goes wrong, what should be happening as a remedy, so that we don't have any problem if somebody has delivered but somebody else doesn't want to pay because they're executing right through to the payment. And that is the part where it really becomes powerful. And we have to see that the more 
we are talking about a clearly only virtual event, the more powerful do smart contracts become. Because it means that basically if we're talking about you paying for the right to download a movie, all of that can just happen in the virtual space. And at that point, smart contracts are really at the most powerful. There are a lot of propositions in the moment where we're talking about smart contracts without virtual currency, and especially in industrial applications of, for blockchain, where the idea is it's not that important, really, maybe, that we also have a currency. It's also a dirty word. Bitcoin has been used for Silk Road. Bitcoin is probably used for all kinds of bad things. But we still want to be able to use it in a very... We, we, we want to be able to use smart contracts, but without digital currencies. However, that's a fallacy, and I would like to be very clear about that. It doesn't matter whether you take it, uh, whether you call it digital assets or cryptocurrency, or if you have a native token on the blockchain, or if you do like you can do in Ethereum, that you create your own virtual assets on, on top of the blockchain. In the end, what makes smart contracts really powerful is that they can execute through to the payment. And that's also where the disintermediation power happens because we don't need a lawyer anymore in any circumstance because the smart contracts really just does it all for you in any circumstance if it's programmed well and in the blockchain if it's not programmed well you can still not change it tough luck it's like a not well written contract and law but if you have that then you will see new markets arise that before could not happen because the overhead to drive a market the overhead for legal um, handling of, of problems would just not have allowed for these markets to strive. So, to perform trustlessness, you have to be able to share all the information, exa for example, this contract information, with everybody else in that network so they can verify all of that. And this points to another problem. The cypherpunks that actually invented Bitcoin would not at all have wanted everything, all the information to be in the open if they could have prevented that. This is purely a sacrifice to be able for the blockchain to work as it does, sharing the information so everybody can calculate it throughout their own. If they could have prevented everything to be in the open, they would have done it. And for many business situations, this is just something that's not acceptable. It's not even about competition only where companies just don't want to share all the information with all the competitors. But it's also about regulation. At some point, if banks want to use the blockchain, regulators will say, oh, sorry, but you, there's antitrust law. You, you cannot just share all this information which you're practically sharing if you're using the blockchain. So this is one of the hard problems that we are working at. But where public blockchains like they are existing today have very strong limitations. So, what is a smart contract? Um, a smart contract, as I said, is a program. A smart contract should not be confused necessarily with a contract of law, something that you have to sign and everything. There are signatures involved. It, it makes it even more, comp more confusing. But it's important to understand that very often when you hear about smart contracts, what we actually mean is a program. And what we mean is a program that runs on all the different nodes in the networks of all the computers that take part in the network at the same time. That makes it different from just any script that is executing a contract. And because it runs on all these individual computers, it can also not be stopped. Or at least it's very hard to stop. And there's no single person or there's no single entity that can just say, oh no, I'll stop the execution of this contract because it's executed everywhere. And that's make, that makes it so unique. This makes it valuable in being decentralized that nobody can tinker with it, change their mind, sh just make a little addition or change it here or uh, abbreviating it there. It's just not possible because everybody has a copy of that smart contract in that network. So... What makes a village? 
They say it takes a village to raise a child. And again, that's the same pattern here. So if we're looking forward, and we're looking at a computer network aping the very patterns of how our brain interacts socially to find a common truth, not the truth, that's important, but one common truth, one common view of the world, it's not necessarily self-aware through that, but it can't be fooled. And to really get our minds around that, what that is, this new quality of a computer network that cannot be fooled, and to understand that before you could just flip a bit and it means something else, that this is not possible anymore, good or bad. And this is why Ethereum has been called Skynet, because it's exactly that theme, right? All of a sudden, the thing is autonomous, and it does what it wants. And we will see that, and we already see that. There are people losing money on Ethereum because they make a mistake, but there's no remedy. If you make a mistake, you send the stuff to the wrong uh, account, or even worse, you can send it to accounts that don't exist. It's gone. There's no remedy. The only remedy would be to take the entire network down or reset it or just take it back a little bit in time. But that would mean you would have to reach everybody in the network, and everybody in the network would have to agree to do that. Actually, that's our insurance against it not becoming Skynet. Because if it would threaten all of humanity, well, you would probably take it down. So, what's in it for us? Well, if we just look at financial technology, if we just look at this claim of disintermediating the banks, disintermediating rent takers, well, there's, there's a huge chunk of money in the moment that's taken out of the economy, that it can be 25%, that's taken out by financial institutions. Now, banks will not be completely disintermediated, of course, they will just change the role. In a way, they might be changing the role quite heavily. Because if you look at it, a CD printer, as great as CDs look, did not actually really benefit from the internet. That part of the music business, creating a physical carrier of the music, was disintermediated. The music industry as a whole adapted. It took it a while, they couldn't believe it at first. Predictably, video, the, the, the film industry was next. They could also not really believe it at first, although the music industry had just taken a hit. But a certain part of the business certainly went away. And a certain part of the business in finance right now, and a certain structure in business and finance right now, makes it very easy to take a lot of rent. Now, of course, the thing is, I mean, if you work for a living, and you have a certain amount of expenses, even if you just have an increase in your wages, let's say, of 25%, that actually means like 300% more disposable income or something. So the difference could be quite big. What's in it for us, if we have more, if we have more efficient commerce, if we have more efficient um, financial technology, that could be huge. And I believe that the day of fully automated, automized markets will inevitably come. It's not really something we can stop. That's something the technology will find out how to do. And the danger of that, though, is that we will find us in a world where we will have a parallel digital mirror of the truth, where if the real reality is not really reflected well in the digital reality, we might find us in a situation where the digital reality actually counts. So if somebody is supposed to be dead and their will is executed as a smart contract uh, on the Ethereum blockchain, and it turns out they're not actually dead, there will be no way to, to remedy that because, yeah, smart contracts execute. And unless you've built it in elaborately in some way, then you have a split between the real reality and the digital reality and we will have to find ways to deal with that. But in the past, and already, we have kind of uh, this split between the real reality and the virtual reality, for example, in law. Because there are deadlines, there are certain plausible um, uh, rules that are just uh, not necessarily useful for um, depicting every detail in real life, and we accept that. Law has to be a little bit uh, generalizing. Law has to be uh, constructed in a way that we cannot really hope or shoot for achieving ultimate justice. 
with just a ruling, an outcome, something that life can then continue with. And we're perfectly fine with having this kind of parallel world in our world. We're not so fine when we're at the receiving end of it and feel like this is incredible because the re actual reality is every human can see what it actually is, but then the law makes this out of it, and here there's a deadline missed, so then all of a sudden becomes this, and it has nothing to do with reality anymore. But we accept that. We accept that as a function of how life is organized and how it seems to work quite well. And all we're going to see is just that this is also going to happen now in a different way, in the as a digital extra reality, that's not always to be going to reflect what the actual reality is. And the earlier we think about that, and the more we think about that, and that's really my, it's almost my personal call to arms, because it's, I think that's something that we're really not talking enough about often, how, this, how these consequences could be mitigated or how we can work with them and how we can um, create an interface, so to say, between the real reality and the digital reality, the better the outcome will be. So what's in for us? Maybe three times the disposable income, um, maybe a lot of time. Keynes predicted almost 100 years ago that we would now only have to work two hours a day. That's not quite what happened. On the other hand, I went away from another edition of this workshop in Stanford, and for some reason I can't recall what it was, I was just like, what are we actually doing, actually? Are we just improving the administration of the administration of ourselves? How many of us are actually growing crops or building houses, and what is all the rest doing, actually? All of us that stare in the computer screen all day on our mobile phones all day, what are we actually doing? Are we just administrating each other? <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I think it's pretty close to the truth that this is what's going on. And this is the sole reason why we don't work two hours a day. Also, the other reason is we might not have a good idea what to do with the rest of our time. Now, we all here in the room are probably incredibly privileged in that we probably really like our jobs. Or at least more than many other people. Well, maybe that's wrong, even. <laughs> maybe we're just better in suppressing our hate for it. I don't know. <laughs> but the question is, what are we going to do with the power that the blockchain might be able to give us to change our lives? And it's also it's a thing about the mindset. And I have, like around the corner from where I live, there's a little booth, looks like a telephone box, and it's full of books and teddy bears. And the idea is everybody can take, give and take teddy bears and books to that booth. And pessimistically, I was convinced in the beginning like this would be burned down in no time. Well, it wasn't. It still stands. And it seems people are actually using it. So I was referring to singularity opening this talk and about this is a dream of all of us merging our minds in this computer, overcoming the real reality and living in a virtual reality. But the idea is before singularity comes a time that's called post-scarcity. Scarcity. And that is a time where basically we have managed to solve all these distribution problems that nag the reality that we live in in the moment. But the question, of course, is if you have a telephone booth full of teddy bears and books, which used to be luxury items just like 100 years ago. What does that mean? Have we arrived at post-scarcity, actually, without realizing? At least in some parts of the world, but the parts of the world where most of us come from? Because teddy bears and books, I mean, my mother certainly didn't have the wealth of, of luxury that is just in that telephone booth that nobody even burns down. So, the question is, are we lagging behind already with our minds? Did we forget how to dream already? Because we're creating a society where we work eight hours, or, well, let's be realistic, ten, instead of two. And now we're adding even more power in what we could do with a blockchain, but is it possible that the thing we first would have to learn is to dream up what we actually want to do with it. 
Anyway, what I want to say is that what we can learn here, going back to what's dreaming and how dreams can have to do with place and the earth, that is something where we can just ask ourselves, look inside ourselves personally and go like, okay, what about my own life is it that I would love to change? And then we could look at blockchain and say, yeah, right, blockchain is going to be a solution to do this and that and that and that. But the general trajectory of the whole idea of changing our lives, having the next revolution in commerce, making it even more efficient, make it even better in achieving wealth or material dreams. How is that going to help us to be happier? to feel more love in our lives and to be a stronger member in our community. Thank you. <laughs>